Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. I think what we need to do is just answer some general questions around aging and studies of aging, because I think that's going to be really helpful for people as they hear what you and Matt have to say to break down NAD, rapamycin, metformin. And so maybe what we'll start with is just if, you know, you can remind people at the, like the highest level, are there any biomarkers of aging that we can look at when we look at these molecules? Well, certainly what I would say is when you contrast aging with a field like lipidology, uh, our hands are a little bit tied, right? So if, if, if your objective is to lower ApoB because ApoB plays a causative role in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you have the perfect biomarker, it's ApoB. So even though you have multiple different ways that drugs can go about lowering that, they can inhibit synthesis primarily, they can increase clearance, they can imp uh, impede absorption, all of these things, you have a very clear biomarker that you can track. And uh, of course that's true for a number of drugs. Um, but when it comes to this field of aging, um, it really is difficult. And I, I, I'm guessing, Matt, that there are gonna be some people who will argue that we have remarkable biomarkers for aging. Um, and then you'll have others, and I'm probably more in this camp, that would argue, actually, we don't really have any good biomarkers for aging. I, where do you sit on this, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think you're right. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that you have to consider um, is really what do you want a biomarker to do? Right. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're obviously talking about biomarkers of biological aging. And so what you, what I think you really want is a is is something you can measure that is predictive at either the individual or the population level of future health outcomes, you know, mortality, certainly, but also functional outcomes, disease risk, things like that. So, you know, I think. Um, at one level, we absolutely have biomarkers, right? We can we can look at each other and to some extent come up with somewhat of a precise measure of biological age, right? We can look at two people who are the same chronological age and humans are actually pretty good at estimating, you know, who's in better health. So so we've evolved to do that. So there must be these underlying molecular biochemical signatures that we can find that are predictive of that. Um, and, you know, I think it's a work in progress. So this has been ongoing since the 1980s, trying to find these molecular biomarkers of aging, and, and it's still a work in progress. It's an interesting time, as you suggested, where we have some candidates now, and certainly there are people in the field who are very optimistic. Um, some people, some would argue maybe overly optimistic about how well those candidates work. And it's also an interesting time because we're starting to see commercialization of these, you know, so-called aging clocks that are being sold to the general public. Um, and again, you know, I think you can have a debate about what the evidence is that these things are actually measuring biological aging. Are they doing it accurately? But, um, but certainly I think I feel like we're closer than we were 15 or 20 years ago, but we're still a ways off from that sort of definition that I gave of having something that you can measure that in a predictive way at either the individual or the population level, you know, really tells you with any level of precision what, what the biological aging trajectory is. Yeah, and, and, and so <clears throat> I think the example you gave is a pretty good one about just the, the eyeball test, right? So if you took two people who are 50 years old and looked at them and one had lots of muscle mass and great posture and you know looked like a physical specimen of health and the other one was sort of slumped over maybe uh, morbidly obese you know you, you take the exact opposite of that um, it's it's probably the case that the fitter person would look younger and even if you could look at their face and see the same number of wrinkles and assume that they're well they're probably the same age you would still predict sort of a younger biologic age of that person so you're right there's something in the gestalt that's pretty obvious but truthfully at least for me what would be really valuable would be blood-based biomarkers potentially more elaborate but let's start with the blood where you could do interventions for a short period of time and if in fact those interventions would, if continued, lead to better lifespan or health span, and let's just keep it simple and say lifespan, they would show up. So for example, if you took an individual and you calorie restricted them for three months, 
So you took them down to 70% of their um, weight maintenance caloric intake. You would like to think that there would be some set of biomarkers that would suggest an improvement in their lifespan. Um, wh what do you think about that idea, Matt? Yeah, so I mean, I agree completely with you that, that from a pragmatic perspective and a usefulness perspective, that's exactly what we want. And I think that's what you know the field has been searching for for a long time. It's a complicated, um, it's a complicated question that you're asking though, because you know, I think it's, it's one thing to uh, hypothesize that there are going to be molecular biomarkers that reflect aging, right? Biological age. Those are not necessarily going to be the same biomarkers that reflect rate of aging. And what you're talking about, a short-term readout almost has to reflect rate of aging or even, you know, potentially this is speculative reversal of biological aging. And so my only point is those may not actually be the same markers for each of those classes. So I certainly believe that there will be signatures of um, intervention response that are predictive of efficacy. I'm not sure that it's going to be the same as the signatures of biological age. Um, and this is actually, it's, an, it's actually a really interesting area because you know, I think uh, if you had asked me 15 or 20 years ago when I was really getting started in this field, you know, um, the, the kinds of interventions, you mentioned caloric restriction, that's kind of the gold standard that, that we've been studying for many, many years. Are those slowing aging or reversing aging? I would have answered they're slowing aging, right? They are, you know, um, decreasing the rate of decline or damage accumulation. Um, what's been really interesting and I think exciting over the last uh, 10 years or so is the observation that at least some of these interventions reverse many of the molecular changes that go along with aging and in many cases the functional changes that go along with aging. So you talked about blood biomarkers. I agree with you. That's a great, that, that would be great if we had blood biomarkers. I'm actually a, a big fan of functional biomarkers. So looking at organ function, tissue function, um, that's harder to do in people than it is in laboratory animals in some ways. But, but I really feel like, you know, those are telling us something fundamental about, about future health outcomes um, that, that you can almost take to the bank, right? It's, there's still some stochasticity involved. There's still some luck with staying alive. But if you can, if you can make somebody's heart function better, their brain function better, you got to feel pretty good about that. That you're, and if you can make multiple organs and tissues function better with the same intervention, I think you can make a case that you are in fact modulating some underlying biology of aging as opposed to to only the biology of that tissue and organ. Yeah, and frankly, Matt, that's I mean, that's exactly what we do in clinical practice. The reality of it is, um, and we'll talk about these things, but you know, I'm not looking at epigenetic clocks, right? I'm just not. Um, how do I? know if we're moving or how do I believe, I guess you'll never really know if you're going to talk about this with some humility, but what gives me great confidence that we're moving in the right direction with a patient, it's basically when all of those functional things improve. So if VO2 max improves, muscle mass improves, strength improves, cardiovascular efficiency improves, phenotypic markers of disease improve, right? So glucose disposal, insulin signaling, ApoB, lipid markers, inflammatory markers. So are those, maybe those are just biomarkers of aging. I mean, they're certainly my crude version of those things. Mm -hmm. And again, some of those are things you measure in blood. Some of those are things that you, you know, measure non-invasively. Some of those things are um, imaging related. I think, you know, until someone comes up with better tools, this is basically how I think about this problem. <laughs>